Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Innovation in Hepatology, Biomarkers for Hepatocellular Carcinoma in Surveillance and Management of Patients with Chronic Liver Disease. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's webcast is presented by LabRoots.com, the leading social media site for science professionals, and sponsored by Abbott. Abbott is a global healthcare company devoted to improving life through the development of products and technologies that span the breadth of healthcare. Abbott serves people in more than 150 countries and employs approximately 74,000 people. As a global leader in the large and growing in vitro diagnostic market, the company develops customer-focused solutions that enhance clinical decision-making and improve the lives of patients. In an effort to help doctors determine how to best treat their patients, Abbott has pioneered innovative ways to screen, diagnose, and monitor a vast range of health conditions with greater speed, accuracy, and efficiency. With the best information available, doctors can make treatment decisions faster. As a result, Abbott has become a leading name in immunoassay diagnostics, blood screening, bedside testing, and companion diagnostics. For more information, please visit www.abbott.com. Before we start, there are a few instructions. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credit. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credit. And we want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. Answers are welcome, too. You can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your comments and questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can, and we'll follow up if we don't have time today. Want a better look? You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button on the top right or use the Q&A button. We'll make sure we try to resolve any issues. Now let's get right to today's presenter. We are proud to welcome Amet Singhal, MD. Dr. Singhal is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Medical Director of the Liver Tumor Program at UT Southwestern Medical Center. He is board certified in gastroenterology and transplant hepatology by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Dr. Singhal is a member of several professional society committees and serves as chair of the International Liver Cancer Association Surveillance and Biomarkers Special Interest Group. He is on the editorial boards of several journals, including Seminars in Liver Disease, Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology, Clinical Translational Gastroenterology, and Clause Medicine. Dr. Singhal has published over 50 peer-reviewed scientific papers and over 20 review articles and textbook chapters on hepatocellular carcinoma. A poll question will now appear on your screen. Please select your answer and then close the poll by clicking on the X in the right corner. Thank you. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Singhal. Thanks, Judy. So as you've heard, today we will be talking about hepatocellular carcinoma surveillance and the potential role of biomarkers. As you've heard, um, the program is sponsored by Abbott, and all contents in the presentation related to Abbott products is consistent with applicable requirements. My disclosures you can see on the slide here. Um, of most note, um, I am on the Speaker Bureau and serve as a consultant to Bayer, as well as um, have been on an advisory board uh, for Waco Diagnostics. In terms of the talk today, we will start by discussing the efficacy of HCC surveillance to improve survival, primarily in patients with cirrhosis. We will then move on to discuss the efficacy and effectiveness of ultrasound and other imaging-based modalities as this serves the base of HEC surveillance in most countries. We will then move on to discussing alternative imaging modalities and some of the data supporting or not supporting using alternate imaging modalities. And finally, the majority of our talk, we will be discussing the use of other biomarkers, including alpha-beta protein, AFPL3, and of course, PIVCA2. So to start, hepatocellular carcinoma is the fifth most common tumor worldwide and the third leading cause of cancer-related death. As you can see from this map, the highest incidence rates of HCC are in East Asia and Africa, and this is related to high rates of endemic chronic hepatitis B. However, its incidence in those areas is on the decline related to um, increased hepatitis B vaccination programs and higher rates of hepatitis B treatment 
among at-risk individuals. Although it has an intermediate risk, um, intermediate rate in the United States and Canada, its incidence is on the rise. <clears throat> Over the last 10-year period assessed by SEER, a large cancer registry in the United States, HCC has the largest increase in incidence among all solid tumors. In parallel with the rapidly rising incidence rate, HCC also has the fastest growing death rate. You can see from this figure that we are actually doing a, a very good job with most cancers and the mortality rate for those cancers is actually declining. However, when you go to the bottom of the slide, you can see that the mortality rate for liver cancer has nearly doubled over the same 10-year period. As most people know, the most important risk factor for HCC is the presence of underlying liver disease. Patients with underlying liver disease go through cycles of inflammation and repair, eventually leading to cirrhosis, which is the key underlying risk factor for many patients with HCC. With the resultant to genomic instability in the setting of cirrhosis, somatic mutations lead to the formation of dysplastic nodules and eventually HCC. Although many patients in East Asia and Africa um, do not have cirrhosis, they often still have underlying liver disease with high rates of non cirrhotic chronic hepatitis B. <clears throat> the large majority of HEC cases in the United States and Europe actually occur in the setting of cirrhosis, even those patients who have chronic hepatitis B. Understanding the local at-risk population is important when it comes to early detection as it highlights the at-risk population to which surveillance efforts should be targeted. Prognosis for HEC is largely driven by tumor stage at the time of diagnosis. If HEC is found at an early stage, patients are amenable to curative therapies, such as ablation, resection, or transplantation, and they can achieve five-year survival rates approaching 70%. Patients found at an intermediate stage are um, only uh, amenable to palliative therapies, including chemoembolization or radioembolization, and the median survival is close to two years. Patients found at an advanced stage have a median survival less than one year, even with our best um, chemotherapies at this point. Unfortunately, most HEC, at least in the United States, continue to be detected at a late stage. You, you can see data from SEER that only a minority of HEC cases are diagnosed at a local stage. Although this has improved over time, you can see that the majority of cases still are found at a distant stage instead of a localized stage. And as we discussed previously, this is crucial given the strong association between tumor stage and survival rates, as you can see um, on the right-hand side of the slide with the one-year survival rates. To improve early detection and overall survival, several societies have recommended HEC surveillance in high-risk patients, including those with cirrhosis, with most societies um, recommending surveillance using ultrasound every six months. The, these societies include the major liver societies from the United States, Europe, and Asia. The best data for HEC surveillance is a randomized study among 19,000 patients with chronic hepatitis B. There were approximately 9,500 patients who were randomized to undergo surveillance with ultrasound and alpha beta protein, and approximately 9,500 patients who were randomized to no screening. Patients who underwent surveillance had a significantly greater portion of tumors detected at an early stage, facilit facilitating a receipt of curative treatments. Most importantly, the trial demonstrated that HEC surveillance using a combination of ultrasound and alpha protein reduced mortality by 37%. It should be noted that this prior study was conducted in patients with chronic hepatitis B, and these results may not be applicable to patients with cirrhosis given increased liver nodularity and higher rates of liver dysfunction. Although there are no similar randomized control trials evaluating the benefits of HEC surveillance in patients with cirrhosis, this benefit has been demonstrated in several cohort studies. Here you can see um, results from a meta-analysis of several cohort studies in which we were able to highlight the association between HCC surveillance and detection of HCC at an early stage. Studies demonstrated a fairly consistent benefit from HCC surveillance with a pooled two-fold increased odds of finding HCC at an early stage. We also found a strong association with improved survival with a two-fold two increased odds for three-year survival. 
However, this analysis is limited by notable limitations, including lead time and run time biases, given that these studies were cohort studies and non-randomized. Among the several cohort studies that had evaluated the association between HEC surveillance and improved survival, there were five that statistically adjusted for lead time bias. And here you can see the results from these five studies. Notably, all five studies continue to show a strong association between HEC surveillance and improved survival after adjusting for lead time bias. The ability for HEC surveillance to improve survival is largely um, uh, predicated on the availability of efficacious surveillance tools. This systematic review identified 12 studies that evaluated the efficacy of ultrasound to detect HEC at an early stage. And you can see that ultrasound had a pooled sensitivity of 63% for detecting HEC at an early stage among these prospective cohort studies. We found that adding alpha-beta protein to ultrasound increased the sensitivity to 69%, although this difference did not reach statistical significance. Despite these data, surveillance failure is one of the most common reasons for late-stage tumor detection in clinical practices. This was a study um, conducted among patients with advanced HCC detected in academic centers involved in Home c which was a prospective cohort study, uh, sorry, prospective randomized trial um, in patients with hepatitis C. We found that failure of detection was the most common reason for late-stage tumor detection. Surveillance failure was attributed to an absence of detection, meaning that the surveillance test failed to find the tumor in nearly 61% of patients who were found to have tumors beyond TNM stage T1, and 70% um, and of those who were detected beyond Milan criteria. These data suggest that we need better surveillance tools to improve early stage detection in clinical practice. These poor outcomes are in part related to the gap between efficacy and effectiveness of ultrasound in clinical practice. So let's quickly review what these two terms mean. Efficacy describes the performance of a test under ideal circumstances. So that's performed in the best patients by the best providers with the best equipment. Effectiveness describes the performance of a test under real world circumstances, where patients can be non-compliant, they may have comorbid conditions, Providers may have lower levels of knowledge about treatments or simply forget to do something, and where equipment may not be top of the line or the newest model. In this table, you can see how a more efficacious test, that is therapy B, can be less effective if there is less access, less uptake by providers, and or less patient adherence. Data suggests that ultrasound does not appear to perform as well when used in clinical practice. So this is a study where we assess the effectiveness of surveillance ultrasound in nearly 450 patients with cirrhosis, of whom 41 developed HCC after a median of 3.5 years. Given that this was an effectiveness study, ultrasounds were per performed as part of clinical care, and many patients received surveillance testing locally out in the community instead of at the tertiary care university hospital. We found in this study that ultrasound only had a sensitivity of 44% of, um, for HCC at any stage and disappointingly low at 32% to find tumors at an early stage. So comparing the figures of efficacy and effectiveness back to back, you can see that there truly is a large gap between the efficacy and effectiveness of ultrasound for detecting HCC at an early stage. Although its sensitivity could be as high as 63% in prospective cohort studies, when conducted by experts in high volume centers, its sensitivity was nearly half that at only 32% when conducted by average sonographers in a real world clinical setting. So the gap between ultrasound's efficacy and effectiveness could potentially be related to several factors. First, ultrasound is thought to be operator dependent. So its sensitivity likely varies with operator experience and knowledge a better knowledge base regarding liver anatomy, and the ability to simultaneously interpret images while scanning may yield higher sensitivity rates. <clears throat> Furthermore, patient characteristics such as obesity and or liver nodularity may also impact ultrasound sensitivity for early stage HEC detection. This has been seen in other diagnostic tests, such as the impact of breast density on the sensitivity of mammography or female gender on the accuracy of treadmill stress tests.
In the last couple of years, there's been a couple of studies that have started to evaluate what factors may um, impact ultrasound's accuracy. So the first was a retrospective analysis of a multi-center Italian database with um, nearly 1,200 patients. And in this study, Del Palgio and colleagues found that ultrasound failure occurred in approximately 30% of cases. The good news is that this decreased from 33% of cases in the 1990s to only one-fourth of the cases in the 2000s. They found that surveillance with success was higher in child QA um, patients than those with more advanced liver disease, suggesting that liver nodularity truly plays a role in ultrasound sensitivity. They also found that HEC surveillance was associated with features um, consistent with aggressive tumor biology, suggesting that surveillance failure may not only be related to operator dependency, but also in some cases related to bad tumor biology. If this is the case, then really improving um, surveillance uh, sensitivity may not be able to detect all tumors at an early stage. However, this retrospective analysis could only establish associations, not necessarily causality, and further research in this area is still needed. We recently performed um, a subsequent retrospective cohort study um, among patients who underwent ultrasound exam for a cirrhosis-related indication between April 2015 and October 2015. Three fellowship-trained abdominal radiologists collectively reviewed all of these ultrasound exams and categorized the exam quality as definitely adequate, likely adequate, likely inadequate, and definitely inadequate to exclude liver lesions based on anatomic coverage, visual clarity of the liver, and or other exam limitations. So among 941 patients, we found that 20% of ultrasounds were inadequate for HEC surveillance, 134 which were um, uh, categorized as definitely inadequate, and 57 exams that were categorized as likely inadequate. In multivariate analysis, we found that inadequate quality was associated with male gender, body mass index category, child QB or C cirrhosis, alcohol-related cirrhosis, NASH cirrhosis, and performing the ultrasound exam um, while the patient was an inpatient. We found that ultrasounds were inadequate in over one-third of patients who had a BMI greater than 35 or NASH cirrhosis, which is highly concerning that given that these, are thought to be, that these are thought to reflect the future epidemiology of HCC in many parts of the world. So potential solutions to um, ultrasound's poor effectiveness include use of imaging with higher sensitivities or combining ultrasound with biomarkers. Over the next few slides, we'll discuss data evaluating each of these options, focusing primarily on the value of adding biomarkers in combination with ultrasound rather than alternate imaging modalities. So given limitations of ultrasound, there are some who use CT or MRI for HEC surveillance in clinical practice. A recent national survey in the United States found this practice was particularly common in centers with a liver transplant program. There are few high quality data evaluating CT or MRI for HCC surveillance, with most studies evaluating these modalities simply in a diagnostic fashion. As far as I'm aware, this is the only study evaluating CT for HCC surveillance. Here you can see data from a small randomized trial in which 163 patients were randomized to semi-annual surveillance ultrasound or annual surveillance CT and then followed for an average of three years. Over this time period, there were eight HECs in each arm with no differences in early detection or HEC-related mortality between the two arms with the caveat that, of course, these numbers are very small. Of note, there was a higher rate of nonspecific nodules in the CT arm, resulting in more follow-up testing, despite, once again, a similar proportion of patients being found at an early stage. And as expected, CT surveillance was substantially more costly per HEC detected than ultrasound-based surveillance. This abstract at ASLD um, a couple years ago was one of the first to evaluate MRI in a surveillance manner. This was a prospective cohort study um, involving 407 patients with child QA or B cirrhosis who were then followed for a median of 1.5 years, yielding a total of 1,112 surveillance rounds. 
Over this time period, 35 patients developed HCC, with 26 having very early stage tumors, and an additional eight having early stage tumors, um, according to the BCLC staging criteria. The sensitivity of MRI was significantly higher than that of ultrasound for both HCC overall, as well as very early stage HCC. However, the authors did not perform a cost analysis comparing these two modalities. And you can see from these numbers that you would imagine that MRI would not be cost effective in this fashion, given the fact that you had to do over 1,000 MRI um, exams to detect a small fraction uh, of HEC at an early stage compared to ultrasound-based surveillance. So it's clear that better biomarkers are needed and likely paint the future of HEC surveillance. There have been several studies examining biomarkers, including alpha protein, ASPL3, and PIVCA2 being some of the best known. There are several other biomarkers that are currently undergoing biomarker phase two and phase three development studies. So before going into data for each of the biomarkers, I just wanted to quickly review the recommended five phases of biomarker development. The first phase is biomarker identification, which is typically done through preclinical studies. Once this is done, the next phase is case control studies that characterize the ability of a biomarker to distinguish HCC versus non-HCC. Although you will see variability in studies, including some that we will present today, the most important factor in these studies is distinguishing HCC from cirrhosis or chronic hepatitis B infection not distinguishing HEC from normal patients or other cancers per se. Once again, going back to the fact that HEC typically happens in the setting of chronic liver disease. Furthermore, it's important to focus on the performance of a biomarker to detect early HECs, because this is really the goal of HEC surveillance is to find patients at an early stage, not simply to detect HEC at any stage. And unfortunately, most biomarkers do a much better job detecting advanced HEC but once again, this is not helpful in clinical practice. And once again, as you'll see in several of the studies that we present, there's often a mix of early stage HEC and advanced HEC in several of these studies. And when looking at the data, it's really important to focus on the performance for early stage HCC. The third phase is retrospective longitudinal studies, which determines the ability of a biomarker to detect preclinical HCC, that is HCC once again at an early stage. This phase is also important for determining the best cutoff to use in phase four studies. Phase four studies are prospective cohort studies in which these biomarkers are included in the management algorithm and diagnostic tests are actually performed if any of those biomarkers are positive. This will help establish performance characteristics, including sensitivity and specificity, when actually implemented in clinical practice. And finally, phase five studies are randomized control trials in which clinical benefits and harms among a target population can best be determined. As you'll see over the next few slides, alpha theta protein is the only biomarker that's actually completed all five phases of biomarker development, with most of the other biomarkers having only completed um, phase two studies. So let's start by um, discussing um, AFP, the best characterized and most commonly used biomarker in clinical practice. As many of you know, there is great debate if AFP should be included in HCC surveillance. It was included in many prior guidelines um, as a potential adjunct to ultrasound, but was recently removed from the, um, from the ASLD as well as ESL guidelines, given imperfect sensitivity and specificity. Now, there are many people who still believe AFP can add value and improve early detection in clinical practice. For as many folks who believe in AFP, there are several others who still contest that AFP is imperfectly sensitive and specific for routine use in HEC surveillance. And here you can see some of the titles from commentaries that have declared the death of AFP in HEC surveillance. So let's take a step back from this debate and actually examine some of the data surrounding this issue. The first thing is that most people will agree that AFP should not be used in isolation for HCC surveillance. There's very little debate about this. It should be used in combination with imaging. In this meta-analysis evaluating AFP performance characteristics, 
Five studies met inclusion criteria and were analyzed. The overall quality of evidence was felt to be limited. Only one study universally applied an acceptable gold standard test. Three of the five studies used a case control design that potentially overestimated diagnostic accuracy. Using the most commonly reported cutoff of 20 nanograms per milliliter, sensitivity of AFP ranged anywhere from 41 to 65%, specificity from 80 to 94%. The authors of this um, meta-analysis concluded that AFP has limited accuracy for HCC surveillance when used in isolation. However, AFP appears to be a benefit when added to ultrasound, at least in clinical practice. While once again going back to the beginning discussing the efficacy data, while AFP was not a significant benefit in prospective cohort studies, and you can see, once again, the sensitivity for early stage tumors went from 63 to 69 percent. It appears to be a benefit when used in real world clinical settings. So taking a look at the effectiveness setting, this is once again going back to that study um, that was conducted among 450 patients with cirrhosis. We found that adding alpha feta protein to ultrasound in clinical practice significantly increased sensitivity for early stage detection. Ultrasound alone, once again, had a sensitivity of 32 percent for finding tumors at an early stage, and this was doubled to 63% when adding alpha-beta protein. So these data suggest that alpha-beta protein um, may be of additional benefit in some cases, particularly when ultrasound quality may not be ideal. Now, for the skeptics um, who are on this webinar who think that ultrasounds only had limitations in that single center study, you can actually see similar data from the HALT-C cohort. So to quickly review, this was a study evaluating maintenance interferon among 1,050 patients with hepatitis C infection and advanced fibrosis. This was a secondary analysis in which the authors characterized the accuracy of HEC surveillance tests, um, most notably ultrasound and alpha-beta protein, to detect HEC at an early stage. And similar to what we observed in our single center study, Ultrasound only detected one-third of HEC at an early stage, and alpha-beta protein substantially improved sensitivity for early-stage HEC detection, going from 36% all the way up to 51%. Now, most studies to date have only assessed one-time measurements of AFP instead of serial AFP levels. And of course, this doesn't um, accurate, accurately reflect how we interpret data in clinical practice. When we see patients in clinic, we use all data, including prior measurements and the current measurements. So this is a study using data, once again, from HALT-C, where we found longitudinal measurements of alpha-beta protein, along with patient-specific risk factors, had higher accuracy for HEC detection than using one-time alpha-beta protein measurements. You can see that using this ROC analysis, that using longitudinal measurements had an area under the curve of approximately 0 0.8, which is actually very accurate. So to quickly review um, AUC interpretation, um, an AUC of 0 0.5 is essentially a coin flip and, and highlights um, a non-helpful test, whereas um, an AUC of 1.0 is perfect. And so an AUC of 0 0.8 is regarded as being highly accurate. Furthermore, most studies have assumed that AFP performs equally well in all patients, independent of liver disease etiology or severity. However, patient characteristics can significantly influence the performance of AFP with a markedly higher specificity in hepatitis C negative patients. Similarly, others have reported that the specificity of AFP can be improved by adjusting for ALT level as a surrogate for hepatic inflammation. Therefore, these data suggest that AFP may be used in some patient subgroups, such as those without viral hepatitis. This is particularly important to keep in mind as the epidemiology of HEC shifts from hepatitis C-related to NASH-related in many parts of the world. Finally, although AFP is imperfect when used alone, it may be possible to develop an algorithm to increase AFP accuracy. So we know that AFP levels are not only influenced by the presence of HEC, but also underlying severity and activity of liver disease. At any, given, at any given AFP level, low platelets, low ALT, and older age are associated with increased risk of HCC. So this was a study that was recently published uh, in gastroenterology, and 
gives you a nice algorithm for interpreting these uh, AFP levels after adjusting for other values, including age, ALT, and platelet count. And taking a look at this, you can see that a 70-year-old patient with an AFP level of 20, the predicted risk of HEC in the next 6 to 12 months, can significantly vary from less than 10% to over 50% as the platelet count and ALT decrease. So although, that, although AFP has um, promise and is useful in some patients, um, and it can be improved by some of these modalities, it's still clear that better biomarkers are needed. So first, we will discuss AFPL3, the glycoform that represents the LCA-bound fraction of AFP. AFPL3 is thought to be the fraction of AFP that is produced by HEC in early stages. And the initial thought was that this should be more accurate for early tumor detection than AFP as a whole. AFPL3 is reported um, as a percentage of AFP. Unfortunately, early studies hampered enthusiasm for the biomarker given lower sensitivity than expected for early tumor detection. AFPL3 only had a sensitivity of 37% for early HEC in the phase two early detection research network study, and only 25% in a secondary analysis using HALT-C data. Since those data, the company has introduced a more sensitive assay, which should hopefully improve accuracy as we move forward. In addition to higher sensitivity, the assay also allows reporting of AFPL3 results among those with normal AFP results. So this was a phase two study in which authors compa compared the conventional AFPL3 assay to the new assay among 74 patients with cirrhosis and 94 with HCC. Overall, the sensitivity of AFPL3 was significantly higher with the new assay, 45% versus 13%. Of importance, the increased sensitivity was most marked for early stage tumors, defined as TNM stage T1 in this study. Both assays appeared to work well in late stage tumors, although once again, this is less clinically important. Similarly, this study among 396 chronic liver disease and 270 HEC patients compared the conventional and the new assay among patients in whom AFP, AFP did not work. That is, all patients in the study had an AFP level less than 20 nanograms per milliliter. As you can see, the sensitivity for HEC at any stage was significantly higher for the new assay, 42% versus 7%, although it did have a lower specificity of 85% versus 99%. Of note, on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see that the sensitivity for early tumor detection was also significantly better, 35% versus only 5% for the conventional assay. Something else worth noting from this study, which will be discussed over the next few slides, is the complementary nature of the biomarkers AFPL3 and PIVCA2. AFPL3 had a sensitivity of 35% when used alone, PIVCA2 20% when used alone, but the two had a higher sensitivity of 45% when used in combination. Finally, the last biomarker we will discuss in detail will be PIVCA2. PIVCA2 is an abnormal prothrombin protein that is generated due to acquired defect in post-translational carboxylation. This process occurs in the liver but is impaired in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. Because of its nature, it is important to note that PIVCA2 will be falsely abnormal in patients who are on Coumadin or who are vitamin K deficient. Similar to AFPL3, some of the early studies hampered enthusiasm for PIVCA2. For example, a secondary analysis of data from the HALT-C trial in patients with hepatitis C infection demonstrated a sensitivity of 55% for HEC at, an, at any stage. However, there have been subsequent studies which have rekindled enthusiasm for this biomarker, and we will review these over the next few slides. So this study included 219 patients with hepatitis B-related cirrhosis and 157 HCC, of whom just under 30% had unifocal tumors less than three centimeters in maximum diameter. So the, um, one uh, thing of note when you're interpreting the overall data is that many of these patients had larger tumors. There were also 879 patients with non serotic chronic hepatitis B which um, we will not be discussing those data um, in today's uh, webinar. 
You can see that the sensitivities of AFP and PIVGA2 were 59% and 74% respectively. The sensitivity of PIVGA2 was significantly higher than that of AFP with a p-value of 0.04, although it had a lower specificity of 90% versus 97%. The AUC for early stage HCC was 0.71 for uh, AFP and 0.75 for PIVCA2, which was not significantly different between the two groups with a p-value of 0.51. Unfortunately, the AUC for the two uh, biomarkers in combination to detect early HCC was not reported in this study. The second study of, of interest is one from China, including 75 patients with cirrhosis primarily hepatitis B related as one would expect, and 236 patients with HCC. Once again, the study also had patients with cirrhos without cirrhosis, but we are not going to discuss the non cirrhotic data in this presentation. Similar to the prior study, PIVCA2 demonstrated a significantly higher sensitivity for HCC at any stage, 73% versus 59%. However, the AUC for HCC detection was similar between the, biomark between the two biomarkers, uh, for early stage detection at 0.82 and 0.81. Using the two in combination increased the AUC for early tumor detection to 0.86, suggesting that the two may have additive value and may be useful to use together. The final PIVCA2 study we will review today is the Phase two Early Detection Research Network study from the United States which included 417 patients with cirrhosis and 419 patients with HCC. The patients had a mix of liver disease etiologies, including 60% who had hepatitis C and 35% who had non-viral liver disease. Nearly half of the HCC were early stage tumors per the Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer Staging System. The sensitivity for early HCC detection was 53% for AFP and 61% for PIVCA2. Of note, once again, using the two in combination resulted in a substantially higher sensitivity uh, for early detection of 78%. Uh, the authors conducted a post hoc subgroup analysis comparing viral versus non-viral etiology, and they found that AFP had similar sensitivity, specificity, and area under the curve for early HEC detection between non-viral and viral etiologies of liver disease. The same did not appear to be the case with PISCA-2. PISCA-2 had lower sensitivity um, and area, among, uh, area under the curve among non-viral patients than viral patients, with an area under the curve of 0.75 in viral patients and 0.65 in non-viral patients. Once again, the common theme you can see here is that using the two in combination resulted in higher performance compared to AFP alone in both subgroups although the benefit appeared of, of using the two in combination appeared to be less pronounced in non-viral patients. The authors examined the biomarker distribution of the two biomarkers, which highlights the complementary nature of the biomarkers. First, you can note that there are many patients who had both elevated AFP and PIVCA2 levels, as you can see in this circle. However, there are some patients who only had AFP elevated AFP levels and others who only had um, elevated DCP levels. Using the two in combination allows detection of some of these other patients while at an early stage. And this was a study that comes from Athens in which the authors um, showed a similar principle um, of the additive value of PIVCA2 and AFPL3. The authors examined 60 patients with HCC who had AFP levels below um, the diagnostic level of 200, with the majority having an AFP level less than 50. Although 20% of patients had an elevated AFP level, AFPL3 level, um, and 20% uh, had an uh, uh, elevated PIVCA2 level, there were 40% of patients who only had um, one of the two biomarkers elevated. Of note, 40% had neither of the two biomarkers elevated, highlighting the novel biomarkers are still needed. In terms of biomarkers, I'd like to end briefly discussing the GALA score, which um, really ties together nicely the complementary nature of these biomarkers like we've discussed today. 
So to quickly review, this is a scoring system that includes gender, age, AFP, AFPL3, and PISCA2. The score was developed in a phase two study from the UK comparing HEC patients and those with chronic liver disease of a mixed etiology. This score was recently value, uh, validated in a, a multi-center phase two study using cohorts with over 5,000 patients from Germany and Japan published in clinical, gastro, ga, clinical gastroenterology and hepatology um, earlier this year. You can see that the sensitivities of the Gallup score in the Germany cohort and Japan cohort were 88% and 71% respectively, with high specificities in both cohorts. The AUC for early HCC detection in both cohorts approached 0.9, which is excellent. There was little variation in model performance based on liver disease etiology, including viral and non-viral mediated cirrhosis. So we reviewed a lot of data for the top three biomarkers that have been in development, AFP, AFPL3, and PISCA2. Going back to the phases of biomarker development, AFP is the only biomarker that has gone through all five phases of biomarker development, including a randomized trial showing its ability to detect HEC in clinical practice. Other biomarkers, including AFP, L3, and, P and PISCA2, have completed phase two biomarker data, that is case control data. Um, and we reviewed most of that data. However, there have yet to be high quality phase three or phase four data with any of these biomarkers. This can be quite difficult as they require longitudinal data collection and sample collection, which not only takes time, but can take a lot of money to do. The good news is that there are a couple large cohort studies in the United States that will become available for phase three biomarker studies. The first is the hepatocellular carcinoma early detection strategy um, uh, study. This is a multi-center study with seven academic centers throughout the United States. There are approximately 1,100 patients with cirrhosis who are currently enrolled, and the goal is to enroll 1,500 patients by the end of this next year. Patients will be followed for five years with every six-month surveillance. Patients will have serum and plasma collected at each of these time points, building a repository for future biomarker development. The second is a multi-centered cohort, stu uh, cohort study that is starting to enroll patients across five centers in Texas. This effort is funded by the Cancer Prevention Research Institute of Texas and will enroll 3,000 patients with cirrhosis um, over the next one to two years. The cohort compared to the um, hepatocellular carcinoma early detection strategy study will have an increased focus on Hispanics as well as NASH cirrhosis. Um, and uh, will primarily enroll those patients, but once again, will have a mixed etiology of cirrhosis overall. These patients, once again, will be followed every six months with imaging and uh, serum collection, building a repository for future biomarker discovery and validation. So we've reviewed a lot of the data for, for these biomarkers, but you can, you can see from the um, different surveillance algorithms that have been adopted in, the, in Europe and the U.S. compared to Japan, that there may be different interpretations of this same data. So when you take a look at what's typically done um, in the United States and Europe, it's typically surveillance that's done every six months, primarily focusing on patients with cirrhosis. Um, and you can see in Japan, that when you take a look at patients with cirrhosis, the surveillance interval is shorter, so three to four months instead of six months, although it may be longer for patients who have other risk factors such as non-cirrhotic uh, non chronic hepatitis B. Typically, um, the uh, EASL and ASLD guidelines recommend surveillance using ultrasound um, alone, whereas uh, in Japan, surveillance is uh, typically done using a, a complementary nature of both imaging and biomarkers. And surveillance methods can include not only ultrasound, but inclusion of biomarkers, alpha beta protein, PIVCA2, and AFPL3, as we've discussed, and can include using um, uh, CTs um, as well as EOVIST MRI every six months um, in some patients. Um, now, in the United States and Europe, there have been some there has been some adoption of CT um, and or MRI every six to twelve months when ultrasound is suboptimal. Um, although, once again, this is not advocated by um, either of those guideline societies. Um, and you can see in, uh, in Japan that surveillance with EOVIST MRI every 6 to 12 months is um, routinely adopted when ultrasound is felt to be suboptimal. 
So you can see, once again, looking at the same data, um, different guidelines um, as well as different providers um, in different areas can, can interpret these data very differently and adopt very different strategies um, uh, to help these patients. So in summary, um, HCC surveillance is associated with early detection and improved survival in patients with cirrhosis. Although efficacious, ultrasound appears to be operator dependent and has a suboptimal sensitivity in clinical practice. ASP appears to be of minimal additional benefit in settings with high quality ultrasound. However, it appears to be of benefit in most clinical practices where ultrasound quality may not be as good. AFP accuracy may be improved through methods such as adjustment for hepatic inflammation and or use of longitudinal measurements. Initial data regarding AFPL3 um, was a bit disappointing, but recent phase two studies are more promising. Phase three studies are needed to evaluate the new um, highly sensitive AFPL3 assay. And I know that this is planned as part of um, the hepatocellular carcinoma early detection strategy study. Um, similarly, PIVCA2 shows promise in phase two studies, but phase three data are needed. And once again, I believe this is planned as part of the head study uh, to further evaluate this biomarker as well. And then combinations of biomarkers are likely needed given the clinical heterogeneity of HCC, and this appears to truly be the best way to optimize sensitivity and specificity for early tumor detection in clinical practice. Thank you for your time. Um, and uh, open to, to any questions at this time. In presentation, Dr. Singhal, were, were, have you completed? I am. Oh, great. So, excellent presentation. Thanks for bringing that information to us today. Before we get started with your questions, we'd like to do a follow-up poll. The poll question will appear on your screen. Please select your answer and close the poll by clicking on the X in the right corner. Thank you. Here's a quick reminder about how to reach us today. Questions can be sent via the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll get to as many as we can. And our first question is, how do you integrate biomarkers into your current practice? So from my standpoint, um, once again, I, I really take to, I really pay important importance to the, to the the data showing a gap between the efficacy and effectiveness of ultrasound. And so from my standpoint, I think in most clinical practices, including um, my setting, I believe that ultrasound quality can be very can be variable and um, is insufficient to um, when used alone. And so we routinely use um, biomarkers in combination with ultrasound. Now, um, in in my in my, in my experience, once again, AFP is the only one that's actually completed all five phases of biomarker development and is the best study. And so that is the one that I use um, routinely in combination with ultrasound. So my patients with, um, with cirrhosis um, receive ultrasound and alpha beta protein every six months. Um, although I think that both AFPL3 and PIVCA2 are very promising and have, um, you know, good phase two data, um, I personally am waiting for for phase three data and, and uh, more data evaluating how these should truly be used in clinical practice before routine implementation in all my patients with cirrhosis. Um, I think there are select cases where um, AFPL3 and DCP um, can be helpful, um, e even with current data. So if I have a patient who um, has had normal imaging but has a continued high AFP, um, you know, in some of those cases, I may have, uh, I may check AFPL3 and DCP to, to help evaluate that, that elevated AFP. Um, and then likewise, in some patients who are truly high risk that I'm um, very concerned about um, HDC, um, I think some of the data showing the complementary nature um, of these biomarkers, I may use it in select patients. But overall, most of my, the vast majority of my um, cirrhosis patients undergoing surveillance receive ultrasound and AFP um, every six months. How is the stability of the PIVCA biomarker? Um, so the stability, um, I guess, can you clarify the question? Well, um, the person um, 
um, I would invite this person to um, to um, clarify further. Um, please, um, please do so. So um, you mean? Meantime, I, mean I guess. I guess I'll 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 answer as I as I think that the um, the question is meant. But I guess if, if clarification comes in, then in, and I didn't answer it, then. Um, once again, I'm happy to to re-answer the question. So, um, you know, I think from from a standpoint of of um, PIVCA2 or DCP, the biomarker is stable in the sense of it's um, able to be measured and it's able to, um, you know, be measured in routine serum collection. Um, and so there really isn't any fear of, of using it in clinical practice in terms of stability. How relevant is the analytical performance of AFP assays when assessing longitudinal changes in AFP levels in HCC surveillance? In other words, what is a significant difference in AFP level? Yeah, so I mean, I don't think that we know exactly, like if an AFP level goes from, you know, 15 to 19, we don't have the exact cutoff in terms of what increase um, you should start getting worried about. Um, I think that the bigger thing that I take a look at is is the trend overall. So if if I see somebody who um, has an elevated biomarker, uh, like an elevated AFP of of 25, and then I recheck it and it's 23, and then the next time it's 29, and then the next time it's 26, and it wavers around a stable um, level, then I am less worried about that patient than I am somebody who goes from even a low level AFP level of like eight that then goes to 15, that then goes to 23 to 27. So I, I, I take a look at this in terms of a trend rather than any one specific increase of, you know, four nanograms per milliliter or, you know, eight nan nanograms per milliliter. I think really the trend over time is, is really the best way to look at this. Given the emerging genomic data that categorizes HCC into subclasses enriched for etiologies, HCV seems genetically distinct from HCV ETOH. Uh, has this influenced subgroup analyses, e.g., the specific markers that may be useful in only HCV or uh, ETOH? Yeah, I, I think that you know, th I think that's really where we need to go with HCC surveillance is really more personalized um, HCC surveillance algorithms. I think that our current approach of using whether it's ultrasound or out, out some, um, and AFP, or um, is is really um, outdated these days. And so, you know, in many of the other cancer screening programs, they've gone to much more tailored um, algorithms, uh, depending on, either on clinical factors or on um, underlying genetics. Um, and so, I think that that's really what we have to start doing in terms of patients with cirrhosis is finding, um, you know, whether, whether it's clinical factors um, such as simply hepatitis C versus non-viral, or if it's molecular markers that would say, you know, based on this patient's um, underlying uh, risk or underlying uh, clinical uh, features, we should use this surveillance algorithm. And I think that really is hopefully going to be the future of HEC surveillance. Unfortunately, um, I don't think we're there yet. Are there any side effects if a patient is doing ultrasound every six months in his life since his 20s? Ultrasound is, um, it's one of the nice things about ultrasound is that it's a safe test. There's no radiation. There's really no, um, no harm that, you know, comes from doing the ultrasound um, itself. Now, of course, this is in contrast to um, CT scans where you get both radiation and contrast. And so um, there's two things of note, and this is, I think, at least in my opinion, why CT surveillance should not be done, is because of the harms of doing CT scans. And then when you take a look and you consider both ultrasound and alpha beta protein, um, or you know AFPL3 or PIVCA2, even though there's no direct harms from doing those biomarkers or doing the ultrasound, there are harms that can come from the downstream follow-up procedures if they are falsely positive. And so I would say in terms of answering this question, I think ultrasound itself is very safe, um, and I wouldn't be worried about any cumulative harm, even if they've been getting this for, you know, since their 20s and so getting this for 60, 70 years. I wouldn't be worried about that. Um, it would be more so um, any potential harm from, from getting follow-up, uh, you know, diagnostic testing for false positives. 
How did these findings inform the assessment of treatment efficacy? Um, so I, I think that um, in terms of, I mean, of course, the, the correlation between, um, you know, surveillance and treatment efficacy is really the ability to find tumors at an early stage. And so, you know, um, the biggest driver of prognosis for HCC, once again, is finding tumors at an early stage when we have curative therapies available. And so um, if we find tumors at an early stage, they can undergo resection, ablation, liver transplantation, and have, you know, five-year survival rates approaching 70%. And I think that that is why there's such a big push to try to optimize sensitivity for finding tumors at an early stage. Um, and I think that what we want to do is we want to try to use, um, you know, imaging um, and, and biomarkers to really inc to optimize the proportion of patients found in an early stage. But in terms of, you know, specific surveillance modalities influencing uh, treatment effectiveness or efficacy, it doesn't necessarily matter. It really is just a matter of finding the tumors at an early stage. Looks like we have time for one last question, and it is, do you have a correlation or correlation data between AFP and HBV virus loads? So um, uh, AFP in, in chronic hepatitis B patients is, um, it acts similarly in terms of the patients with um, hepatitis C. Both the um, hepatitis B and hepatitis C patients um, can have false elevations in their alpha beta protein that are driven uh, by um, the underlying hepatic inflammation driven by the virus. And so, um, you know, patients who have um, inflammation driven by the hepatitis B can also have elevated um, alpha beta protein levels that are falsely elevated. Um, so I think that in terms of both chronic hepatitis C and chronic hepatitis B, um, my, at least the data that I've seen and my understanding is that the AFP elevations are more driven by the ALT level rather than the virus level itself. Are there any other, we're going to just have in one more question, time for one more. Are there any other uses for these markers beyond surveillance, uh, for instance, prognosis, monitoring the severity of the tumor? Yeah, so there, you know, um, there are data that show, um, for let's say for, for AFP, there are, there are data that show that um, patients with a high AFP often have higher rates of recurrence um, after liver transplantation, resection, or ablation. So, um, and then, um, you know, there's, uh, there's data showing that patients who have elevated, very high um, elevations of AFP, PIVCA2, or AFPL3 have higher rates of vascular invasion um, and or metastatic disease. So they are related to not only tumor burden, but to related to prognosis. Um, so, in similar to the Gallup score, there's actually um, another score called the Ballad score, which um, incorporates these three biomarkers and um, has been uh, shown to um, correlate with prognosis very well. So, I think that there there is a potential role for um, you know all three of these biomarkers in terms of prognosis. Um, but I think similar to where they are in surveillance, I think that um, really. Uh, you know, more data is needed there, but I think that we're closer probably to using actually them in prognosis than we are in surveillance, in my opinion. I would like to once again thank Dr. Amit Singhal for his presentation. Do you have any final comments? Um, I, I, I guess this is a, I think in general, this is an exciting time because I think for, for many years, um, all we had was ultrasound and, and AFP. And I think that the fact that these, um, particularly these two biomarkers are um, getting closer to, to having, you know, high quality data and getting closer to, to phase three validation, um, I think it's an exciting time because I think that we really are now going to be able to hopefully make um, strides in terms of improving uh, early detection for patients uh, um, that develop HCC. Great. Um, I would also like to thank our sponsor, Abbott, for making it possible to bring this presentation to you. Um, this webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. 
Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January 14, 2017. You'll receive an email from us alerting you when it's available on-demand and posted on labroots.com. You're welcome to forward this announcement to any colleagues who weren't able to join in today. And um, um, can we have you, oh, okay, sorry. Um, this was going to add one more thing. Um, Thanks for logging on, participating in today's broadcast. We look forward to seeing you next time.